Well, first, I, I really want to thank the forum uh, for inviting me here today uh, to talk about Medicare. I mean, um, so I have 45 minutes, an hour, to explain a program that serves uh, 56, 54, 55 uh, million beneficiaries, depending on how you count them, uh, has spending, uh, benefit spending at about the size of what we're spending on national defense right now. So really, you know, how hard can that be, uh, you know, to cover in, in the next uh, 50 or, or 60 minutes or so? So here's the, the game plan for what I want to walk through today. I'd like to talk, uh, start a little bit about the structure of Medicare, as Sally said, you know, the, the parts of Medicare, who's eligible, a little bit of information about the beneficiaries, uh, and then talk about who are the, the providers, who's billing the program, you know, and how many of them are there. And I think that helps set up a little bit for this afternoon where you're going to be uh, hearing about how these providers are paid. Uh, then what do beneficiaries get in terms of benefits? And then who pays for this? How is this whole financed? Then talk a little bit about the uh, administration of the program. And finally, I want to talk uh, at the very end wrap up, if I have a few minutes left, to talk about dual beneficiary, dual eligible beneficiaries. And, and these are low income individuals who qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid at the same time. So let's talk about the structure, eligibility, and, and benefits and go through the, the parts of this. And I, you know, I was thinking about this, and I. Um, you know, I'm sure you probably have visited a, a hospital that was perhaps built four, five, six decades ago. And if you've been there recently, it probably doesn't look anything like it did when it was first built. You know, a lot of the hospitals that I've been at have, there's a core building that was the original building, and then there's one addition and another addition and another addition after that, and so it becomes kind of a sprawling complex. Uh, the architecture of the additions may be all different. You get inside and things may not line up exactly. And my children were born in, in Fairfax and at that time uh, the hospital had an, uh, an addition that was adjacent to another addition. And the floors, because of the train, didn't quite match up. So there was a second floor, so floor two, and there was also a floor two and a half. Um, and to get from my wife's room to the cafeteria, you went into the elevator, you the door opened, you pushed the button for floor two and a half, it went up half a flight, the back door of the elevator opened and, and off you went. So things didn't exactly line up. And you know, to me that sort of is an analogy for, for Medicare. You know, Medicare turns 50 this year. Uh, the legislation was signed in 1965. Uh, program started in 1966. And it was a reaction to the fact that uh, many senior citizens lacked health insurance. Less than half of senior citizens had health insurance. Those that had health insurance, most of it just covered hospital insurance, didn't cover the rest of it. Um, so the program was initially designed to sort of mirror what insurance and, and the healthcare market looked at the time, looked like at the time, and then has evolved. There's been changes and additions and so forth. But uh, you know, I would, at least in my opinion, I think that if if you were right now to sit down with a blank piece of paper and design a Medicare program from scratch, like you were designing a hospital from scratch on an empty lot, it probably would look a lot different from what we have today. But that's because the, problem, the program has evolved over time. So we're going to talk about uh, four parts of Medicare. Part A covers hospital insurance. B is supplementary medical insurance, and this is mostly physicians, and we'll get into some more of the details later. A and B together, we often talk about as being original Medicare or traditional fee-for-service Medicare. Uh, providers in here are, are paid in a certain way. You'll hear about that more in the afternoon. Uh, and then there's Part C. That was added a little bit later. Part C encompasses the private health plans that participate in Medicare. So beneficiaries have the option of getting their Medicare covered benefits by going to a private health plan. They've been around in one form or another really since the early 1970s. Uh, the latest incarnation is now called Medicare Advantage and we have a lot of them. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, them right now. And then the latest edition is Part D or the prescription drug benefit. So you know, beneficiaries have uh, 
you know, they always had A and B, the traditional program. If they wanted to get their benefits uh, through, uh, through private health plans, they could enroll in a Part C health plan. If they want prescription drug benefit now, they can enroll in that. So they've got, they have choices. So who is eligible? If you're 65 or older and you or your spouse has basically paid payroll taxes for uh, 10 years into the program, then you're eligible. Uh, shortly after Medicare was established, we added coverage for uh, people with permanent disabilities. So if you've been receiving SSDI for uh, two years after that, you're also eligible. And then we also added coverage for individuals who have uh, end-stage renal disease. So if you have kidney failure and you're on dialysis or you need a kidney transplant uh, or ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So we have in 2014 about 54 million Medicare beneficiaries uh, who are eligible. And you can imagine with such a large population there's a great deal of variation in that as well. We have, and these are some of the most recent information we've got available right now uh, based on 2010, 5% of Medicare beneficiaries are living in an institution. Just under a third of them are living alone. In terms of status, almost a quarter are below 125% of the federal poverty line. And so that was a little over $13,000 uh, in 2010. About a quarter are above 400% of the poverty line. Uh, in terms of having supplemental insurance coverage, so this is to help cover some of the things that Medicare does not pay for, and I think you're going to hear more about this in, in the next session as well, 10% uh, of beneficiaries only have Medicare, and that can expose them to uh, high out-of-pocket costs. 14% uh, have Medicaid, and three-quarters of them have some other form of, of supplemental insurance, either because they've purchased a, a Medigap policy uh, or some kind of retiree health coverage from their employer. In terms of health status, about 65% have three or more chronic conditions. About a quarter report that their health is in fair or uh, poor health. Uh, we have a number of beneficiaries who uh, struggle with cognitive or, or mental impairments and a number of beneficiaries who report uh, two or more limitations in activities, activities of daily living. So uh, dressing, bathing, eating, some of the, the self-care kinds of things. Uh, the pie on the left shows the distribution of, of beneficiaries in the program. So the vast majority are aged over age 65. Uh, just under 16% are disabled so that they qualify for the program and they're under age 65. And then you have a few hundred thousand uh, beneficiaries who have end-stage renal disease. So in terms of numbers, the folks with ESRD, fairly, fairly small number of them, uh, although it's been growing over time at about a 4% rate uh, per year, this is a population that's growing. Uh, one of the leading contributors is, is diabetes uh, to kidney failure. And, but this is a population that is very expensive. I mean, we're talking about uh, continued dialysis and, and transplants. And so even though they're 1% of the population, uh, they're 6.5% of the spending. Uh, Marty mentioned, I think, in his presentation that uh, health care costs are not evenly distributed. You know, my father lived in Florida, had a neighbor, fantastic woman. Uh, I think she was 74 when, when I knew her, and I'm not sure I could keep up with her. Uh, one morning a week, uh, she went out kayaking with her kayaking club. She was an avid sailor. She had her own sunfish. Uh, that was uh, two afternoons a week. She'd biking, and uh, I'm not sure she ever went to see a doctor. And so she falls into this least costly half of beneficiaries. So 50% of beneficiaries who have the least cost are responsible for only about 4% of Medicare spending. They just, they don't need health care. On the other hand, at the top, the, the quartile of most expensive beneficiaries, so that 25% are responsible for over 80% of Medicare spending. 
So highly concentrated. Kind of another, another way to run up and, and take a look at this, uh, the, uh, the bars on the left uh, break down between whether you have uh, chronic conditions. Uh, and so it, it shows the, let me just highlight a couple of things. The, the light blue bar shows that 48% of the beneficiaries uh, in this study had three or more chronic conditions only. That's all that, all that they had. And they were responsible for 51% of spending. So having chronic conditions doesn't necessarily mean that you're expensive. But if you look at the dark blue bar, and these are beneficiaries who had any number of chronic conditions plus some functional limitations, this 15% of beneficiaries were responsible for 32% of spending. Let me talk about providers a little bit. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but you'll see here there are a lot of them, right? So uh, in one form or another, we've got over 6,000 hospitals, 12,000 home health agencies, quarter of a million labs, uh, over 660,000 physicians, uh, almost that many other practitioners, and then almost 100,000 durable medical equipment suppliers. So these are the suppliers of uh, wheelchairs and oxygen and, and things like that. If you add up the whole list, we're talking about one and a half million providers and suppliers. Um, I think Jim Matthews this afternoon and my colleague Jess Farb are going to explain some of the payment systems. The payment systems tend to be different for each one of these providers, which is one of the complications. Uh, so it's, it's good to know what kind of provider you're talking about when you're talking about what the, what the payment is. And the other thing, follow up on a, a comment that Marty made, I don't know if you, you caught it, but one of the reasons why it's so hard to rein in spending is that every dollar of spending of Medicare is a dollar of income to one of these. And hospitals, for example, tend to be large employers in the communities in which they operate. Uh, Medicare can be an important part of a physician's income in their practices. So, you know, what seems to make sense from a policy point of view and controlling spending uh, can adversely affect the providers on the bottom line. Well, that's in the traditional AB part of the program. Let's talk about Part C. Now, I, should, I guess I should mention a little bit about terminology. Uh, we talk about here in the slide that there are 1,950 Medicare Advantage and other Part C plans. Well, plans, the, the word is used in, in a number of different ways. Sometimes we talk about a plan as Aetna or Humana, you know, which is the, the organization, the, the company behind it. Plan in this sense, when I'm talking about 2,000 plans, is actually a benefit package. So Humana, the entity, enters into a contract with CMS in a geographic area to offer one or more benefit packages. Each one of those benefit packages is called a plan. So you need to be clear about when somebody says plan, is it a benefit package, is it the entity, what are you talking about? Uh, the plans can be organized in uh, different configurations. The first bullet here talks about a local plan. What do we mean by local? Well, local means that the entity gets to choose its service area, which is typically a county or a collection of contiguous counties. Uh, can be fairly small, can be fairly broad, but the local plan means that the entity is selecting what areas it wants to serve. And these are either PPOs or an HMO that then is going to have a network of providers that the beneficiary has to go to. Uh, we've added to the program what are called regional PPOs. They operate like a PPO. They get paid a little bit differently. Again, this is one of these things you have to know when you come down to payment policy. Uh, regional PPO is just a PPO that has agreed to serve an area that's been defined by CMS. So they're a collection of, uh, it's either a state or a collection of states, and you as a PPO um, have bid on and are going to serve the whole area. And then we have special needs plans, and these are either uh, PPOs or, or, or HMOs that focus their attention on treating beneficiaries that fall into a specific category, the largest of which are the dually eligible beneficiaries. 
but there are also uh, special needs plans called SNPs uh, for those with disabling chronic conditions and those living in institutions. Those tend to be smaller categories. There's another flavor of plan out there called a private fee-for-service plan, and it's almost exactly what the name suggests that it is. To a beneficiary, it looks a lot like the fee-for-service plan under original A and B. Um, some of them are required to have networks, but essentially you can go to any provider that is willing to accept that plan's payment rate. From Medicare, the program perspective, these private fee-for-service plans look like an HMO or a PPO. We're going to pay them a monthly capitated rate, so a per member per month uh, amount. And they're going to incur risk. And again, I mean, I think this is something you're going to hear more about this afternoon. Uh, and then the last type of plan I want to mention are cost plans. They're, technically, they're not a Medicare Advantage plan. They are a Part C plan. You know, is anybody from uh, Minnesota here today? Minnesota is, I think, ground zero uh, for cost plans. That uh, These are plans that are kind of a hybrid. Uh, they're a relic, in a sense. Uh, they've been around the program uh, since the 70s. Uh, Congress in recent years has made some attempts to uh, curtail them or actually uh, you know, let their provision sunset, but they're a permanent part of the program. They're like an HMO with the flexibility that you as an enrollee can go out and see a fee-for-service provider. So you, and they're paid on a different basis. They're paid on a, on a reasonable cost basis. So you have uh, a health plan, but if you're, you don't want to go to that health plan's network of providers, you can go into the fee-for-service world, and Medicare picks up those expenses, and you incur any of the cost sharing that goes along with it. Now, the average beneficiary can choose from among 18 different plans. It certainly varies. It tends in, in urban areas uh, where there's high fee-for-service spending. The choices tend to be more. In rural areas, the choices tend to be fewer. Uh, you know, one thing I also want to caution you, because this is the difference between talking about the entity and the benefit package. In most areas where beneficiaries live, there are dominant plans. So maybe one or two health plans, as in the organization, serve that county. So it looks like there's a lot of competition going on when you see, well, a beneficiary has 18 choices. Well, it may be because uh, nine of them are offered by Humana and nine of them are offered by Aetna. So you've got a choice between two organizations. Uh, this pie chart shows the distribution of plans. If I were to look at it by the distribution of enrollees in those plans, it would look remarkably similar. So about two-thirds of the plans and about two-thirds of the enrollment are in HMOs. About a quarter of them are in local PPOs. And the rest are distributed among the private fee-for-service plans or the regional PPOs or the cost plans or there are some other, other types of plans there as well. All right, let's skip on to part D. Um, if you as a Medicare beneficiary want to get outpatient prescription drug coverage, you sign up for a Part D plan. If you're in the fee-for-service original Medicare, you go to what's called a standalone plan. Uh, there are about, across the country, there are about a thousand different plans. And so this is an add-on to your fee-for-service coverage. If you're in Medicare Advantage, you choose one of the packages that the plan offers that covers prescription drug benefits. So uh, the Medicare Advantage plans have to offer at least one benefit package that covers prescription drugs. So you have a choice. This shows the, the distribution um, by the, I think there are 34 regions. So it illustrates that I think in Alaska, uh, among the standalone prescription drug plans, beneficiaries have a choice among 24. Uh, as much as 32 plans to choose from in, looks like Texas and California, uh, Nevada. So on average, about 30. 
Let's talk about benefits now. So Medicare was set up to cover services that are reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis or treatment of an illness or injury. So that's why for years and years and years, I mean, this, this is uh, diagnosis and treatment, Medicare did not cover preventive care services. That's a fairly recent phenomenon. Congress stepped in, add, added coverage uh, for things like an annual wellness visit, uh, for vaccinations, uh, for certain screening services. Medicare does not cover most long-term care. Uh, I think that's a surprise to, to some beneficiaries. Uh, it also does not have any kind of a, at least in the traditional program, does not have any kind of cap on out-of-pocket spending. So you, if you need a great deal of care and you don't have any form of, of supplemental insurance to help cover that, you can be financially liable for uh, quite a few expenses. And by original statute, the Medicare program is not allowed to interfere in the practice of medicine. So I'd like to talk just briefly about some of the specifics of what's, what's covered under each. So Part A, the hospital benefit, covers hospital inpatient stays. Uh, for the first, first 60 days, you're responsible for a deductible of $1,260. After that, there's a coinsurance per day. If you go over 91 days, you start dipping into your lifetime reserve days. And this is for a, a, spell of, a spell of illness. So you could have more than one hospital stays in a year, and so you could be responsible for more than one deductible in a year. This is how come the expenses can build up. Uh, skilled nursing stays, it's covered if you've been hospitalized for three days prior. Uh, home health is covered. It has to be a plan of care from your doctor. You have to need intermittent skilled nursing care or uh, physical therapy or occupational or, or speech therapy. Uh, there is no cost sharing for this. And hospice care for beneficiaries who have been determined that uh, basically they're in, within their last six months is also covered. Part B covers physician visits and hospital outpatient services. Uh, it covers the preventive care services that Medicare now, now offers, uh, ambulance, clinical lab, diagnostic tests. It also covers certain prescription drugs. Sometimes people, when they, you know, they focus on prescription drugs and they think, well, you know, Part D. Well, that's the, um, here we're, looking at Part B drugs. In 2010, this was just under $20 billion. Uh, and these are drugs that are typically prescribed by the physician and the, the, uh, that are injected or um, given by the physician in his office. Uh, many of them are cancer drugs. They tend to be relatively expensive. Uh, when we last looked at it, we found, I think, that the, the most expensive uh, 55 drugs were responsible for about 85% of that nearly $20 billion. Uh, many of the drugs coming online are, tend to be relatively expensive. Part B, it's a voluntary program. If you want to have it, you sign up for it. You pay a monthly premium. Uh, the vast majority of beneficiaries do. You pay a, a standard premium of $104.90, uh, more if your income is higher. You're subject to an annual deductible of $147. On most services, but not all, you're responsible for a 20% coinsurance, uh, which is waived for, as I said, some of the preventive care. Um, about 95% of Medicare beneficiaries pay the standard premium amount. But if you're lucky enough or unlucky enough, I don't know how you want to look at it, uh, to have much higher incomes, you can be responsible for much higher premiums. Uh, so in 2015, the premium will go up to $335.70 per month. If your individual tax return is $214,000 or above. Uh, benefits in Part C. So these are the, the private health plans. 
they have to cover everything that's offered under A and B, with the exception of hospice. You can still get hospice, uh, but you basically step out of the plan at that point, at least for the hospice care. And the reason that they're popular with beneficiaries is that they typically offer other kinds of services that Medicare does not. So they may cover some dental care, or they may cover vision care or eyeglasses that Medicare does not, uh, or they can reduce cost sharing. So you know there are some things that are very attractive to beneficiaries, and we'll look at the growth of the program uh, in a minute. Uh, if you want to be in a Medicare Advantage plan, you have to be in Part B first, so you still have to pay your Part B monthly premium. And on top of that, the HMO or the PPO can charge a monthly premium. It uh, doesn't have to, and not all do, um, but they can charge an additional premium. They may offer, as I said, the Part D drug coverage. Uh, they're required, at least one of their benefit packages. They have some flexibility in how they set up cost sharing. But there are some limitations on that. Uh, one is that the, the cost sharing can't be set up in such a way as so as to discriminate. I mean, you couldn't set cost sharing so that it was pretty low for most things, but very high for oncology services, which would tend to discourage the enrollment of anybody who has cancer. So that's one of the things. Uh, Medicare Advantage plans now are also required to have an out-of-pocket limit, which can vary, and plans can determine how much that is up, up to a certain limit, but that's an attractive feature as well that's not offered in original Medicare. Now this is enrollment in Medicare Advantage, or the private health plans over time. Uh, this graph starts in 1999. If we could look a little bit more to the left of this and see what was happening during the 90s, you would have seen a rapid rise over time. Uh, when the predecessor to the current Medicare Advantage program was envisioned and set up, it was thought that this is a program that's going to save <laughs> Medicare money that we were going to pay these plans 95% of what we were spending in fee-for-service, and because they were so much more efficient than the fee-for-service program, that that would help control Medicare spending. Well, private health plans in Medicare have never saved money for the program. They've always cost the program a lot more than fee-for-service. For beneficiaries' point of view, though, however, they have provided a lot of additional benefits, and that's why they've proven popular. Uh, why the graph shows 18% enrollment in 1999 and then slowly trending down is that in 1997, Congress passed the Bu Budget Balance Act to help control Medicare spending. One of the things that it did was reduced payments to plans, which meant that plans did a couple of things. In some markets, they withdrew from those markets completely. Uh, Many of them also reduced the extra benefits that they offered, which even though they were still in the market and offering their services, they were less attractive to beneficiaries and so fewer beneficiaries enrolled. Uh, so it continued to decline until 2006. And the magical thing about 2006 is at that time, we decided to throw a lot more money at plans. Plans used to operate in fairly limited parts of the, the country. They tended to be mostly in the, the urban areas uh, where payments were mostly generous. Uh, and one of the things that Congress wanted to do was to make sure that all beneficiaries had access to plans and had a choice of a wide variety of plans. And so there was a conscious decision then to increase payments to Medicare Advantage plans which allowed them to operate in more areas. It's also allowed them to offer more generous benefit packages. And so since 2006, we've seen a steady increase in the enrollment. So now what was kind of a fringe part of the Medicare program is a huge part of it. So nearly a third of Medicare beneficiaries are getting their covered services from private health plans. Um, 
Some of the things in the Affordable Care Act, uh, once again, look to the plans to try to rein in spending a little bit. They're still more expensive than treating beneficiaries in the, in the fee-for-service world. Uh, but we haven't seen yet, not all, of these, not all of these provisions are fully implemented, we haven't seen yet uh, a decrease in enrollment. Now Part D has kind of a, a quirky benefit package associated with it. You're, a beneficiary is subject to an annual deductible up to $320. Uh, after that, the beneficiary's drug coverage for about 75% for a period of time. And then there's a coverage gap where there's sort of partial coverage. And then after that, there's catastrophic coverage. Uh, let's just see where that came from. Before healthcare reform, when the Part D drug benefit was implemented in the first place, it looked like the bar on, on the left. So. For the first little bit, before you hit the deductible, you're, you're responsible for 100% of the cost, then only 25% of the cost, and then you fell into the donut hole, which was about, I think, one out of five beneficiaries, something like that, along that order, which meant that none of your expenses were covered uh, until you had sufficient amount of out-of-pocket spending, and then you reached the catastrophic coverage so that then you were only paying 5% up above that. One of the things that the Affordable Care Act did was try to slowly, over a, a long period of time, fill in the donut hole. So by 2020, the prescription drug benefit will look like what you see on the right. There'll be a deductible. Uh, for a period of time, you'll be paying 25% of your drug costs. Uh, and after you reach a su sufficient amount of out-of-pocket spending, uh, you get to the catastrophic coverage. But we're only partway there. Now, prescription drugs are expensive, uh, and so is coverage. So healthcare reform also provided for subsidies for beneficiaries who have low incomes. Uh, the lower your income, the more generous the, the subsidy is. Uh, basically, the subsidy covers uh, all or most of your, your premium <coughs> and cost sharing. A little over 11 million beneficiaries received the, the low-income subsidy in 2014, uh, although you know, we suspect that there are a lot more individuals out there you know, who would qualify. This graphic shows that 68% uh, of Medicare beneficiaries are in Part D plans. Uh, so we have <clears throat> 24 million that are in plans and are uh, you know, are, are paying the full premium. Uh, another 11 million who are in plans that are paying uh, maybe some of it or, or, or a little of it because they get the low income subsidy. And then we have 3 million, uh, this is not Part D, but we have uh, 3 million beneficiaries who are getting retiree coverage and their employers are getting a subsidy from Medicare. So essentially what the law said is that, you know, we don't want to set up a prescription drug plan where suddenly employers decide to drop the coverage that they're currently providing. You know, that would be expensive for Medicare, so what are we going to do? We're going to provide, if an employer is offering a prescription drug plan that meets certain criteria, then we're going to subsidize that, a 20%, 28% subsidy. Uh, so as long as you as an employer are offering your, re your Medicare eligible retirees a drug benefit that is equal to or better than the Part D plan, then you can get a subsidy from the government, uh, which for Medicare is cheaper in the long run. And currently, that's about 3 million beneficiaries. And then the rest, uh, the other quarter, either have no drug coverage or limited drug coverage. All right, well, let me talk about financing here. Medicare program is really paid out of three buckets. So it's either going to be uh, payroll taxes or general revenue or premiums. Those are the three big buckets. And it depends which part you're, you're looking at, uh, which one of those is kind of most important. So HI, Hospital Insurance Trust Fund, this is part A, this is where the payroll taxes come in. So as you're working, 
you're paying 1.45% of your wages. If you're self and the employer pays the other uh, half of that, if you're self-employed, uh, you pay full freight. You pay both sides of it. As of 2013, if you're high income, you pay a little bit more. Um, and there's also the, the trust fund earns some money from interest and, and tax on part of uh, that's levied on Social Security benefits. Part B mostly comes from general revenues and beneficiary premiums. The Part B premium is set to cover about 25% of the cost of the program. Uh, Part D comes from general revenues and beneficiary premiums. Again, I mean, the premium is set to cover about 25% of the program. Uh, and payments from states. Well, why is that? Well, before the drug benefit was introduced, states were providing drug coverage to Medicare beneficiaries who also qualified for Medicaid. When Medicare took over that responsibility, that meant that that was an expense that the states were no longer incurring. Uh, it was being taken on by Medicare and, and the federal government. So there were clawback provisions written into the law. So states are contributing a portion of what they would have paid under the old regime uh, to Medicare. So this shows how different the, the parts of this are. 88% of the revenues for Part A are coming from the, the payroll taxes. And so there actually is a trust fund. And for Part A, people, the idea is you, you, know, you pay in while you work. Um, and then it's drawn out of the trust fund. We'll talk about the sustainability of that in a little bit. Uh, there, there also is a trust fund for, for B and D, but it's more of an accounting thing. I mean, money flows in, money flows out. It doesn't really uh, accumulate. And the revenues there are mostly coming from general revenues. It doesn't really make sense to talk about sustainability uh, in that sense. And you notice that I don't have a bar for Part C, and the reason for that is the, the health plans are providing A and B benefits, and so they're paid both out of Part A and Part B, so there isn't a, a separate trust fund for them. One of the things that gets people attention is the solvency of the Medicare program. And when we talk about solvency, typically we are talking just about the Part A. It's like how we have this trust fund, you know, we've built up these assets over time, how long are they going to last? And that's varied over time. Uh, We've been down in 1970, we were down to two years' worth of solvency. Currently, the Medicare trustees tell us uh, this is based on the report that they did uh, last summer that we've got 16 years to go until the trust fund runs out. Now, when the money runs out, it doesn't mean that the Part A benefits would stop because we still have people paying payroll taxes in over time, right? So, you know, at least, a re at least initially, the program could continue to pay maybe 80% of its benefits, and that would decline over time. So it's a measure of, you know, how we're doing on the program. Uh, the solvency, the number of years until we reach insolvency, until the trust fund is, is exhausted, uh, over the last few years has been pushed out. There are a number of reasons for it. You heard Marty this morning talk about the slowing of Medicare, uh, the growth in Medicare. You know, that's a big reason for it. Um, some of the provisions in the Affordable Care Act were put into place to try to slow Medicare spending. You know, that's probably contributed to it. Uh, we probably don't understand all of this entirely. You know, when the be interesting to see when the 2015 trustees report comes out, you know, what they think and how much they're, uh, how much they're putting in stock in the slowdown and how long that will last. Now, even though the spending growth has slowed, one thing that keeps growing are the number of beneficiaries. So you'll see here right after the historic projected line, you'll see here that the, the line is much steeper in the growth of the number of beneficiaries. That's the baby boom generation. So we're going to continue to add beneficiaries uh, at a rapid pace until you know, we get past the baby boom around 2030. Um, I think the other thing to note is we talk about the aging of the population, you know, more, 
larger fraction of the population being over age 65, being over age 80, so forth. Uh, that's true. But if you're looking at the Medicare population and you're looking at the average age, it's actually becoming younger. You're putting more and more 65-year-olds into this population. 65-year-olds tend to be cheaper to care for than 85-year-old beneficiaries. And so that also can be part, you know, that might help contribute at least a little bit uh, to the slowing down in per capita spending. One of the things you'll find if you look in the trustees report is a projection of, for Medicare spending, and this is for all parts of it, A, B, and D, for Medicare spending, how large of the economy is this? And so currently, Medicare spending accounts for about 3.5% of GDP. And they make a projection over time, so it says by 2040, we're going to be 5.6%, and by 2080, 6.8%. But any kind of projection of this depends upon what kind of assumptions that you're making. And the trustees used to make their assumptions based on current law, you know, which basically says, you know, if you continue all the provisions that are in current law right now and, and, and you forecast out, uh, you know, what would spending look like? And they still mostly do that, but they make a couple of adjustments. And one of the adjustments is for something you're going to hear a great deal about this afternoon called the sustainable growth rate. And this is how physicians are paid. And I'm not going to try to go over that, except in just a uh, very small amount. Essentially, the method we have for paying physicians has said for more than the last 10 years that physician fees are going to go down. And for more than the last 10 years, Congress has said, mm, no, not going to let it. Uh, so we're either, instead of having physician fees decrease, we're either going to hold them constant or give them a small increase. Well, if nothing is done in the next few weeks, then physician fees will fall by about 20% on April 1st. And so the Medicare trustees could have incorporated that into their projections. I mean, that is current law. That is what is supposed to happen. And if they had done that, then Medicare spending trended out over time would have looked lower and it would have been a smaller portion of the GDP and the graph would have looked a little bit different than it does right now. Um, but the trustees realized, hey, Congress has always stepped in and intervened. What are the odds are that we're going to actually allow a 21% fee cut to occur? Uh, probably pretty small. So the trustees then have stepped outside of the current law baseline and they've come up with a different kind of baseline that says, hey, you know, we expect Congress to do in the future what it's done for the last decade, and that's going to become our basis. But they did incorporate another assumption, one that they're not quite sure about, and that is that there are some important cost savings measures that were introduced by the Affordable Care Act that would hold down payments to hospitals and other types of providers over time. And it's and it's based on the assumption that these providers can realize some productivity increases over time. And it's not clear whether they can sustain those. And if they can't sustain the productivity increases, that means their costs are going to go up and payments are going to be inadequate and Congress might have to step in and boost payments in the future. So the trustees said, well, you know, look at these projections, but they're based on assumptions. And if the assumptions don't hold, the projections don't hold either. So if some of the cost containment mechanisms in the Affordable Care Act don't hold, then these bars that you see here for the percent of Medicare spending as a percent of GDP could be much higher in the future. So you have to pay attention to what the assumptions are. All right, how is the program administered? Well, when, when Medicare was set up initially, uh, it was Doctors and hospitals were admittedly a little bit nervous. They didn't know about dealing with the government, so it was set up purposefully that they would deal instead with contractors, the Blue Cross, the Blue Shield um, entities in, in the world. And so this is what Medicare did. The whole program is basically run by contractors. Uh, currently, right now, we used to have uh, one contract. We used to have 51 different contractors. Now we have, uh, we're working to get what are called um, 
Medicare administrative contractors, max, I just want to say max, uh, get that down to, to 10 to cover the program. And they process the claims, they pay the claims, they're the uh, sort of the first line that uh, physicians and other providers will go to. They are the first line of the, the appeals. Uh, for Part C, we contract with the private health plans, and for Part D, we contract with plan sponsors. So even though there's this entity called CMS, uh, you know, most of the program, the day-to-day -day thing, is being administered by private entities. Uh, we've also set up things that are called RACs, or recovery auditor contractors, and these are doing post-payment reviews, looking for improper payments. They're paid in kind of in a novel way. They're paid on a contingency basis. So they get to keep a percentage of the improper payments that they identify. We have other contractors called Zone Program Integrity Contractors, ZPICs, and Medicare Drug Integrity Contractors, Medics, that are looking for fraud and abuse in the traditional program uh, and in Part C and D. I wanted to mention here, you know, I, a little bit about coverage decisions. So Medicare covers what's reasonable and necessary, right? But that's got to get very specific about sort of which items and, and which, which services. So Medicare sometimes at the national level makes a national coverage determination of what it will cover or what it maybe will not cover. But in the absence of a national coverage decision, the local max are able to make their own local coverage decisions. And sometimes they do this because of concerns that uh, an item or service is being overutilized or uh, concerns that, you know, otherwise maybe the service shouldn't be covered. So they can come up with local coverage decisions. OIG just recently came out with a report on this. I think it's very interesting. You know, certainly what it shows is that uh, while we think of this as being a national program, since these coverage decisions can sometimes be made on the local MAC level, you can have an item or service that is paid for by Medicare in one state, and in the adjacent state, it will be denied. You know, Medicare, I think, is, is moving to try to make that more rational, make more in the sense of, of national coverage decisions, but you know, there's some variation here. All right, the last topic I want to talk very briefly on are these beneficiaries that qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid. So there are about 10 million of them. And we can put them roughly into two camps. The fully, disa the, I mean, the fully dual eligibles, uh, these are individuals whose incomes and, and asset levels are, are low enough that they qualify for full Medicaid benefits. And the partially dual eligibles uh, whose incomes and assets are, are high enough that they, they don't qualify, but they still need some assistance. And so for the partials, the Medicaid programs help pay some of the expenses that they would incur in Medicare. So help pay for the premiums or cost sharing. But they don't get Medicaid benefits. Now, it's a big population. If you want to look at averages, Dual beneficiaries tend to report that they're in poorer health, have multiple chronic conditions, have cognitive impairments, uh, more likely to report uh, limitations in, in ADLs, more likely to be disabled and under age 65. But it's not a homogeneous population. So, for example, we have 25% of the duals that report limitations in three or more ADLs, but half report no limitations at all. So you have beneficiaries who need a lot of care, and some of the duals need relatively little care. Uh, if we look at Medicare, with the, the bars on, on the left, you see that uh, roughly 20% of the Medicare beneficiaries are the dually eligible. They're responsible for about 34% of Medicare spending. In Medicaid, about 14% of the Medicaid population are these dually eligible? They're responsible for about 34% of Medicaid spending. Now, Medicare and Medicaid are very different programs. And 
So you have beneficiaries, the full dual, fully dual eligible beneficiaries who can get benefits from both, and they've got to navigate two programs that really aren't well coordinated right now. Um, and they also have slightly different incentives. So we learned that you know, Medicare doesn't cover long-term care and, and, and nursing homes except in certain circumstances. So if you're, but Medicaid does cover long-term care services. So if you're a Medicaid and Medicare eligible and the state is paying you in a nursing home and you get sick and have to go to the hospital, well, suddenly the state's no longer paying for you because that's Medicare. And for a time, once you go back to the nursing home, Medicare may be picking up some of that. So the state has a rather weak incentive to keep you out of the hospital. So there have been concerns over time about um, maybe there should be better ways to coordinate care and integrate care. And one of the things that Medicare has done has been to set up the special needs plans, the SNPs I mentioned at the beginning, that are especially for the dual eligible. Uh, they're only open for the dual eligible. Uh, they're supposed to provide specialized services for that population, uh, including a, a, a health risk assessment, and then have an interdisciplinary care team. Uh, in 2014, we had 1.6 million dually eligible beneficiaries in what are so-called these, these D-SNPs. Uh, they're not available everywhere. This is in 39 states. Uh, the degree to which they're integrated with the Medicare benefits varies a lot. In fact, only a small percentage of them are really what CMS calculates as, as fully integrated. Uh, that is really providing both the Medicaid and, and the Medicare set of benefits. Uh, one of the things that we at GAO did uh, a year or so ago is we issued a report on the dually eligibles who were disabled and in DSNPs, and we tried to see what kind of a difference it made. Um, these are plans that tend to be rather costly for, uh, for Medicare. We found that uh, we could identify that there were some better health outcomes compared to Medicare Advantage, uh, but we didn't see that there were any reductions in the Medicare services that were being provided. So there wasn't a reduction in the number of emergency room visits or hospital visits. So it's hard to see where the savings are coming from. So there's a lot of interest in coordinating care between the programs and that may result in, in better care. There is some indication of that. It's harder to see where the savings might come from, in part because if you're an expensive for the Medicaid program, it means you're using long-term care services primarily. And if you're expensive for the Medicare program, it's because you're in an acute care setting. And those tend to be very different populations. Anyway, I think I can stop there and answer any questions.